Welcome back, everyone. I think that the free ice cream <laughs> took our people. <laughs> but they will be back, I'm sure. Uh, before I announce the next speaker and the last speaker for, for today, I have to share some useful information oh. with you. Uh, the first one is that there will be a closing ceremony um, at the H Prime stage um, starting uh, 5.30. And also at the same time there will be some sponsors awards um, also at the, at the same time, same stage. And um, after, after that, uh, you are all invited to come join us at the HIPCON uh, party that starts at 6.30 uh, in uh, Komban Dvorana, uh, Jazz Cantina uh, Lisbon. So just ask for the HIPCON matinee party and um, uh, they will tell you where exactly to go. And you are all invited, so let's have some proper fun after all this work. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, our next speaker is uh, Yasha Niklanovic. Yasha, welcome to HIPCON. Thanks. Yasha Hi. is coming nice from here. Slovenia. And you here. And Yasha will tell us a bit more about an interesting topic, um, incorporating engineers into uh, the entire product life cycle. Right? Yeah. OK, yeah. Yasha. Thanks. The stage is yours. Thank you. So, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Yasha. I come from Ljubljana, and uh, I work at Turtle as a front-end engineer. Um, mainly, my day-to-day -day is I try to figure out how the next generation of uh, design tools are going to look like for the web. So that's like, kind of something what we're doing, trying to build. I mean, we're building a tool that you can use to build cool pre interactive presentations such as this one but obviously uh, on a much larger level. Um, so I'm a, quite a cross-functional guy, I have to say. Uh, my interests span from technology to uh, product to design to business. And I've been lucky enough to kind of spend my whole career kind of around creative, innovative startups from mostly London, U, uh, US, China. Uh, working in different levels, different startups of all shapes and forms with different uh, uh, at different stages. So um, yeah, I'm happy to be here today. Uh, hopefully, I'll be able to share some of the things that I've learned along the way. Um, so what we'll be discussing today? Uh, the topic of my talk is incorporating engineers into product management, and. Uh, <coughs> uh, I Essentially, if I had to, I mean, businesses do this in many different ways. Historically, especially in our industry, this has changed a lot. But if I had to drill it down into uh, two extremes on how we do this, uh, I would say that on the uh, left-hand side, on an extreme, you have a kind of concept of a handoff, uh, where in typically, historically, uh, product teams, design teams, uh, business teams uh, figure out what it is we need to build. And then you get this kind of handoff notion to engineering, where engineering is expected to make uh, estimations, feasibility assessments, and so on, and move, on, move over to development plans. And uh, just being here at HIPCON, uh, I mean, it was clear to me before, but now even more, like listening to really cool talks by uh, Dave on the first day, and then Steve today, and uh, you know, many more uh, that, that were here. It seems like a really promising subject, and I'm really happy that we're discussing it, is that I think we as an industry have figured out that this kind of extreme doesn't work. Uh, and that's mostly due to the fact that the way how we build products has changed. And this is not, this hasn't happened this year or last year, but a couple of years ago already, actually. Um, you know, we don't lock ourselves in basements anymore, at least not intentionally. Uh, we like to talk to users, we like to be agile, we like to build MVPs, uh, we like to, you know, listen for market changes, and we like to adapt and we like to survive at the end. Uh, and, um, you know, just a couple of quotes actually uh, from other speakers uh, that have touched on this, like Dave has spoke about how complexity in software, how ever rising technology require, requires us to make a really integrated 
kind of approach on how we do engineering and development. Um, Steve has talked about a similar thing, but mostly due to kind of communicating and attacking tech depth in uh, software. So again, when engineering and uh, product kind of go hand in hand, you know, the idea of tech depth becomes easily manageable, more easily manageable. And uh, yeah, like I said, this, has, this is a huge topic at HipCon. I'm really happy about it. Uh, but this isn't necessarily, I don't want to go into too, many, too much details because I think a lot of speakers before me went into details on how we actually get that done. Um, uh, I want to basically attack a subject that, and I want to go on a limp in, in favor of this talk, and I want to say that the level of integrating, the level of putting uh, engineers at the heart of the product, which a lot of companies are doing uh, nowadays, and I think it's the only same way to go forward, uh, is more uh, a side effect or an effect. Um, and there is a cause which basically allows, makes this really common sense in, a, in some way. Uh, so instead of actually, you know, going trying to figure out how do we do that, we try to think about the cause. And the cause, if I went on a limb, I would say that the cause is company culture. Uh, so it's really, I mean, you can attempt to make integrations between design, product, engineering, but at the end of the day, if your company culture is not right, and uh, if, you know, the things that, that you need to uh, do that are not in place, then you're probably not going to succeed, and it, it might actually even uh, cause more complexity and more, uh, you know, dysfunction to how we do teams. Um, so what are the company cultures that actually, you know, make this a reality? I would say there's uh, uh, many different ones, and uh, as a disclaimer, I'm a startup guy. My whole career I've been around startups, so uh, I haven't uh, worked in big uh, corporate environments, uh, luckily, I would say, for me. Uh, and uh, I decided to pick one of them, which uh, we, as uh, Turtle as well, and some companies that I work, worked for before, try to at least integrate to some degree into how we manage teams, how we treat each other or, as colleagues, and how we manage engineering, and how we manage products. Um, and that company culture uh, was, um, I think, in a large scale influenced by Netflix. Um, this was introduced by Netflix in uh, Netflix. It, uh, it evolved into a manifesto, but it initially was just a kind of a HR guideline that was kind of slowly being developed around 10 years in Silicon Valley. Um, and uh, for that time, uh, I think it was kind of a very disrupting uh, idea. Uh, they were speaking about this kind of concepts of freedom, freedom responsibility and high alignment and loose coupling and obviously our industry wasn't set up in that kind of way. It was very hierarchical, and you know it was very clear uh, how things are working and where your position is. Very functional. Um, and but by then, in the last 10 years, it has actually become uh, some people call it a bible of uh, Silicon Valley. So you see huge companies such as Facebook, Google, uh, Netflix, uh, Spotify, and others integrating into their kind of daily processes, uh, and you know. It seems to work for them well, so we said, why not, why not try to, you know, integrate that into this local environment? If is it even possible? And this is what I will be discussing. Um, so generally, what is Netflix's culture? They use big words such as freedom, responsibility, and high alignment, loose coupling. And I see that uh, in a kind of, um, I mean, working in this kind of uh, environment, I see that as a kind of way more simple thing. Uh, it's mostly about the notion of how we work. So we, nobody, even an engineer or a marketer or a, you know, a design person or whoever, um, we don't re particularly per se get tasks. Uh, we instead get a lot of uh, context. We instead get a lot of alignment to the cause. Um, and, um, you know, based on that, we get objectives, right? So it's really clear what has to happen, what the, where, where the ship is sailing, but at the end of the day, uh, what we're required to do and what we're pushing our colleagues to do is to, you know, kind of take those objectives and convert them to uh, some sort of successful um, release or whatever your metric is. 
in some way. So it's really about getting objectives and then being uh, good enough um, to be able to convert that to something and make your own decision. Uh, so this is really what it is. And uh, another thing that they talk about and I'm found over the years that is a really important thing um, is people over processes and rules. Um, so, you know, I think we've all been in environments, especially I have uh, before, mostly years ago, uh, where you kind of thought that it was your, your organization was so rigid, there was so much bureaucracy that you couldn't get anything done. Um, who here has felt that way, like uh, at some point in our careers, like I can say, yeah, exactly. Uh, so what Netflix is saying that, uh, you know, not all rules and not all processes are bad. You have the good ones that enable people to get their work done and you have bad ones that are there just because some people like rules and processes. And uh, I think it uh, comes down to, you know, the organizational growth and the pitfall of that, you know, the bigger we become, the more our complexity rises. We try to mitigate that by, you know, um, setting up the rules of the game and we become kind of effective in the short term in that aspect. But I will talk about that more uh, in the other parts of this talk. Uh, so the fourth uh, point that Netflix is making is, um, I think, a prerequisite for all the other ones. Uh, so without this one, then nothing else is, I think, possible. And that's uh, the internal information highway. So hi how we communicate uh, internally within a team across departments, I think that's uh, a prerequisite to how we do stuff. So uh, a couple of keywords here, uh, full transparency. So in our particular case, Every engineer, every design person, every marketer, every sales guy, every customer success guy, um, you know, knows, has the option to know everything about the business. So we share our business plans, we share our uh, market opportunities, we all know what's uh, waiting for us if we succeed and what's waiting for us if we fail. And this is a very important thing. So everybody has that opportunity of this kind of, to feel that we contribute and to feel that we have context behind in our engineering case, behind the code that we write. So we're not writing code because of technology itself. It doesn't mean that we're not passionate about technology, but it's not all that we think about. We try to think about how to use technology to serve some sort of goal that our kind of company and our startup has. Um, so yeah, I think this is a prerequisite, prerequisite, and this leads into the next point, which is only allowed if the previous point works, and this means encouraging independent decision-making by employees. And this is where it, I think it becomes interesting and also maybe a bit dangerous. Um, but I think we will speak more about that in the, when we discuss this uh, a, bit, a little bit more. Um, so uh, the last point before going forward is job perks, uh, common sense. So. I'm really happy that uh, even now at HipCon, this has made it very clear to me that we as an industry have adopted this. Uh, not necessarily everything else, but this last part, we have adopted it. So flexible work time is something that we uh, a lot of the time take for granted. And I think our industry has figured out that uh, you know, creative professions such as engineering, yes, engineering can be a creative profession. Don't let your bosses tell you it's not. Um, you know, requires some sort of uh, flexible work time and requires some sort of hands-off in some way, right? We just need uh, the right context and we're gonna get stuff done, but we're gonna get it done on our terms. So it's about um, metrics. The metrics are success, deliveries, and so on. They're not the amount of time uh, that we spend on something. They're not when we checked in, when we checked out. You know, all of these kind of common sense things that allow us to be better people and, you know, focus on the work that we're doing. I think this is also a prerequisite, but this, I think, already works in a lot of uh, things that I've seen uh, here. Uh, so another, just another big guy, uh, before we move on to, like, more what I feel about it, is Spotify, and um, they're speaking about a similar thing, and I've actually visited uh, one of their talks lately and was kind of inspired, uh, kind of... Um, yeah, and I, wanna share, I wanted to share this chart with you guys. Uh, so they're speaking a lot about alignment and autonomy, and it's, uh, I think, a very similar thing to what we heard from Netflix. And it's mostly about that when everybody's kind of aligned, you know, knows where we're going, knows the dangers of not getting there. Um, 
uh, once we're aligned to what needs to be done, then what's really important is that we get the autonomy to do it, that we're not micromanaged every step of the way. And because when we take autonomy to do something, we build ownership, uh, we, you know, we put a part of ourselves into what we do, and then this is how we you know, kind of get motivated to come into work every day on a long period of time and really think about how we do stuff, right? Feel, feel kind of comfortable in our positions and in our lives. So the top right quadrant, what, they say, what they're saying, is kind of the, um, I think, best case scenario where you could be as an organization. And uh, it's a really simple concept. So you see management or whoever is in charge, a leader or a product person or whoever, uh, you know, saying, yeah, this is, this is our objective, so we need to cross the river. And, uh, but he doesn't tell you, unlike in the top left quadrant, he doesn't tell you exactly how you're going to build a bridge, right? Because if he tells you that, then what that leads eventually is into kind of a conformist culture, I would say. Uh, and this is a culture where people are, I mean, this kind of companies, are, I think this is the majority of our, of our sector, I think still. I mean, I think less and less though. Um, but these are the kind of environments where people aren't really used to making decisions on a daily basis. Uh, we're kind of relying on people to tell us what to do. Um, and I feel like that's not the best place to be in to raise your career, to learn the stuff that you need to learn in order to become a better engineer, a better whoever, to you know, grow. I feel like uh, decision making is a big, pro 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 um, I mean, big part of that. Uh, and in the right quadrant, you know, you get the opposite of that. So it's like figure out how, you know, we're going to give you the feedback, we're going to help you along the way, but it's your responsibility at the end of the day to get it done. And how you do it, it's really up to you. And uh, I'm not even going to discuss about this low alignment, low autonomy. Uh, I don't think we're doing that much anymore. Uh, I mean, uh, I'm really happy I don't. Uh, but I'm going to quickly just discuss this bottom right one. Uh, which is the one that I find the most dangerous, actually. I would way prefer to work in the top left quadrant, at least we'd be effective. And uh, I think the bottom right one is kind of a downside of this kind of culture, which we'll uh, talk more about. Uh, but it's essentially, you know, when people don't know we're not on the same ship, we don't know where we're going, and we try to take on their, you know, kind of responsibility of fixing some imaginary problems that either don't exist, or um, that our company isn't in a position to sell or is not you know, going to help any strategic goals that we have. So then you see a lot of kind of chaotic culture. You see people doing all sorts of experiments that usually probably fail because we can't support them on the business side. And this, is kinda, this kind of failure uh, usually leads to kind of frustration, and frustration on a large scale leads to people quitting. So uh, I don't think that's really good for anybody. Um, so yeah, moving forward, um, we saw we saw how the big guys are doing it, how Silicon Valley is doing it, and I don't want to be the guy that comes here and you know says, oh, the Silicon Valley is doing it like this. We have to instantly believe everything that they're saying, right? It's different. We had these discussions, I think, in the unconference, and it's you know the cultures here in the Balkans are I think different. The mindsets are different than in the U.S. That's I think uh, 101. Uh, but that doesn't mean that only the big guys can do it, right? We can, with the right you know, motivation shift and the mindset shifts, we can kind of get there, I believe. Uh, but you know, one thing that's in common with all these big guys is that they have billions of dollars in their accounts to spend on experimentation, and you know, they, they can absorb failure. And a lot of us can't, really, uh, to be honest. And um, so is it, can only they do it? No, but if you're on your last dime, if you took a small investment or if your company took a small investment and you're looking to get an MVP done as soon as possible and it's like a make or break thing for you, like I wouldn't attempt this. Like I would try to make a solid plan, uh, you know, make really concrete deliverables, you know, get everybody on board and ship it. Ship it, sell it, and try to figure out how to do that later on when you're scaling your team and when you're starting to get worried about, you know, am I becoming stale? Am I still in a position that I can innovate? And when you're in this kind of position, like this becomes very important to you. And um, again, um, this is a high risk, high reward type of deal. It's an investment. 
it's a, investing into a company culture like this, on the short term, it can have downsides because if you allow people to make their own decisions, it's very possible that they're going to make the wrong ones. Um, and it's possible that some of your deliverables will be either late or not where they should be. But I think in the long, long term, it's uh, worth the investment because these people are, I mean, we, at least I see that on myself, uh, being in an environment like that. You make the wrong decisions at the beginning for a long time, but if you're humble, if you learn from these mistakes, uh, at some point you'll, you'll start to make the right ones. And this is, you know, where it becomes uh, interesting. This is where you get a company with people like even the lowest of engineers uh, are stakeholders. You know, they care about what we're doing. If you go to parties, we talk about the product, not in a bad way, not in a boring way. But, you know, uh, it just becomes really interesting and it becomes really uh, engaging. And this is, I, I like to think about two companies when I think of this. So on the left side, I would have one company in this example and that would be kind of a, a classic traditional approach, very structured, very functional, uh, very information is stuck in at the top usually and uh, at the bottom we don't get too much context and we're just shipping, we're shipping something that we don't know really what, what the impact has. And you know, on the other hand, you have a company which has gone through this kind of investment stage, has stakeholders in every single department that are ready, willing, and hungry to innovate at every point. They're willing to uh, ship a prototype within a week uh, without breaking a sweat because they're, they know how to and they're used to making these decisions on a daily basis, right? So this is practice. Making decisions is a practice and you get better as you go. And um, you know, when the market eventually shifts, and we know it does, we're in an all probably in highly competitive markets and clients make up their minds every other Wednesday, really, almost, and technologies change and so on. And these co two companies are kind of um, in a position that they need to innovate and they, they need to, um, you know, change and ship something very quickly and change very quickly. So which one of these companies do you think is going to be the first one to attack the new market? Uh, I feel like if I was a betting man, I would b put my uh, money on this other company that, you know, has the people in place that know how to get that done. Um, so yeah, agility, I think that's a new meaning in this kind of concept. Another thing, another positive thing that I've noticed uh, by being in this kind of environment for a while is uh, responsibility. So responsibility shift, but what I think about is actually what I mean by responsibility shift is this classic conundrum, uh, we talked a lot about this in HipCon, of, you know, when product and engineering are very se separated and, you know, you get, you know, it's a very different departments and they don't communicate enough. A lot of the times when we ship certain releases, you know, if they go wrong, you keep on hearing this responsibility shift. So if you ask product, you know, it was us engineers that failed. And if you ask engineers, it was like the incomplete specs and you know it's the products guy. So we're like constantly pointing the finger on somebody. And this, be, you know, this creates uh, a toxic environment. And I think this is a reality of our industry. Uh, and, um, you know, by having this kind of culture, this kind of goes away, you know, because again, it's a cause. And once you integrate this, like a lot of these small problems like tend to go away because when people are used to making their decisions, they tend to take ownership for these decisions and they tend to take responsibility for these decisions because they were allowed to make them, right? If you're telling me what to do, it's on you. Like, I'm not gonna be the one that's responsible for that. And in this kind of case, you see this, this is also what Netflix is referring to the taking out the trash community. So what does that mean? Like, we don't physically take out the trash. It's a metaphor for all aspects of the business of taking ownership of services. So in an engineering context, I would say taking out the trash means, you know, when you see a part of code that you know, uh, you know, it has a cognitive load or whatever, and you know it needs to go away, it needs to better be rewritten. So you're not going to wait for your manager to tell you, you know, oh, this is bad, you have to rewrite that and, you know, whatever. You're just going to do it because you, you, this is yours, you know, you've invested a lot of yourself into this and you have no problems with just doing that. And you're going to ship a lot of this small improvements along the way and they're going to be really up to you and you're going to be responsible to how, the, how they do. But because you're going to have the context and everything, you know you're going to make, you know you're going to do it when you have time and when the company can actually afford it. 
So this is, I think, a responsibility upgrade instead of a responsibility shift, which I think is a good side effect of this kind of culture. Uh, coming towards the kind of final stages of this talk, I wanted to spend some time on the core notion of freedom and responsibility. Uh, I know it sounds simple, but what I've come to kind of believe is that it's not simple. It's actually quite complex. It's quite a nuanced thing. And what is simple, essentially, is telling people what to do. And uh, I've um, kind of uh, been thinking a lot about this, like when I was preparing for this talk, like why is that? Like why are we set up in that kind of way? Uh, and I think it has a lot to do with uh, up our upbring upbringing, uh, how we grow up, right? So if you think about your parents, they were coming home after work when you were young, and a lot of, at least for in my household, there was a lot of um, discussions about bosses. You know, the boss is being an a-hole, and uh, you know he's telling me what to do, and he has this uh, insane deliverables, and you know what the hell, right? And you see my mom doing the same thing, and um, you know you kind of when you grow up and you become a, when you get into a position of some sort of leadership. Um, you tend to, you know, try to fit in into these shoes, and this is where all Hollywood is kind of coming from. Even, you know, if you work hard, you're going to become a manager, and you, when you become a manager, you're going to be able to tell people uh, what needs to be done, and you're going to have five people under you, and this is going to be amazing, and this is how we measure success, right? Um, and I think once you make this kind of shift that uh, people are not in service of management, but like true management is actually in service of people. Uh, and that means that a manager is kind of a shield and a kind of a somebody, you know, like a coach that's empowering people to be good at what they do, to, uh, you know, care about their personal lives, to manage their professional careers, to manage their professional goals, personal goals as well. Uh, you know, when you make that kind of transitional shift, and I think that we all kind of as an industry uh, have to make that shift, then I think this becomes really common sense. And, um, you know, um, the hard thing is to, to give people context and make them make their own decisions, because by doing that, they're going to eventually start making good ones. So they're going to make the personal growth that they need to, you know, become better people and to actually scale their careers. Another thing which I find very important is not, it's not, it's not this. Right? Uh, I mean, we are in startups, we are in heavy competitive environments every day, every year is basically a make or break, so uh, we're not doing whatever, it's not, freedom responsibility is not doing whatever you want. Uh, you remember that Spotify bottom right quadrant where, uh, you know, no context means failure, so no context equal, equal stress, so it's really important that we are communicating enough that we know where we're going if we want to apply this kind of culture. And the one that kind of means a lot to me, I think, is trust. Uh, I think just coming in to a position where, you know, you kind of join as a new hire and instead of, you know, constantly getting a, a, a gajillion tons of uh, load that you need to carry at the beginning, uh, you're kind of treated as an expert. You're, you know, you're trusted from the beginning that uh, you're going to make the right decisions, that you're going to use the team around you to get the context that you need to have the right conversations to ship what it is that you need to ship. And um, yeah, that you're going to be allowed to make the right decisions. That's, I think, a very important part of it. And um, the next one is, I believe that it's also a gateway to creativity. So as I mentioned, engineering and you know, whatever we build, we try to build something, something innovative. We need to be disruptive. Uh, at this point, because every, everything has, every, a lot of things that are worthwhile has already been built in some way. What we're really doing is we're trying to beat the competition and we're trying to, um, you know, in a sea of 500 other companies that are doing basically the same thing, you want to do it better, right? Uh, and this kind of culture really allows you to do that because when you give people opportunities to make their decisions and you treat them with trust, what you tend to see as a side effect is you see what I kind of uh, uh, like to call a beehive organization. You see this a lot of, you know, creative juices as bees, busy bees, you know, people thinking about where we're going, uh, you know, uh, discussing, providing feedback. You know, we have this huge fridge of ideas uh, where everybody, even the CFO, you know, has put something on it and, 
you know, they all, we all kind of feel like we're kind of building this, and it's kind of like a, maybe like a cult in, a, in some way. And, you know, allows people to be creative in some way, and everybody is um, at the end of the day. And it's really liberating to, you know, think about what you can do instead of thinking about what you can do. Uh, so, yeah, the next one is uh, well, free responsibility is leading by example. So if you come in and you don't just expect that, you know, you will be treated in that kind of way, uh, it only takes a founder, a co-founder, a couple of middle execs to start this kind of behavior. Um, but once everybody embraces it, everybody that's in any position of leadership or just collaboration, um, you know, once everybody's kind of doing that, then it's kind of spreads like a virus. So at the end of the day, everybody is um, kind of doing it. And it's only possible if you lead by example. And the last part of this is accountability. So there is no freedom without responsibility, right? We're not just playing around. We don't have Legos, whatever. If you're trusted to make those decisions, then at the end of the day, you have to ship it. So we're, we're relying on you to get it done on time. Uh, how you do it, it's really on your time, on your, based on you, how you want to organize your schedule, how you want to get to that position. Um, but yeah, you're really trusted to take the decisions. If you fail, you're trusted to own them, and you're trusted to kind of show that you've learned from them, and uh, that you're going to be in a position next time that you make a good one, right? So I think that's really important. Uh, this is just a piece of advice, I'd say. Uh, it's really a two-way street, as I started with this previous slide. Um, so, yeah, you can't just come in and expect that people are going to instantly start treating you that way. Uh, if you're in a more junior position, obviously, you know, you're, it's going to take time for you to become a domain expert. Um, uh, in that time, you have to be able to execute a lot of the things that, you know, other people have come up with. Uh, or, you know, you're probably going to collaborate less, uh, but still, you're going to be included into the process nonetheless, because, you know, you want to be in that position later. But even though, like, you're being hired as an expert, uh, be confident that you are that expert, or at least be humble that you are in, in a position that you're going to get there, you are, that you're learning and you're going to be an expert at some point, and that we're going to be able to trust you to get it done maybe in a year or whatever. Uh, it really depends on how complex your product is and how much time it takes to become a domain expert in that. Uh, yeah, so this is uh, almost the end. Um, benefits, so it's kind of a sum up uh, of what we already said. So yeah, the nature of how we build products changed. Uh, we have to be innovating to survive and for innovation, you need creative people, and as we know, creative people are not good in uh, corporate environments. And you know, if you tend to treat people in this kind of way, you're gonna get, you'll most likely get that in return, and you'll be that company that's gonna be able to innovate at some point, and you're gonna be able to survive in the long run. And you're gonna be able to battle complexity when it comes in way better, because you're gonna have a very integrated, very collaborative culture. And at the end of the day, you know, if engineers decide they want to be in this kind of culture, you want to keep these engineers as well. Because I feel like, I personally feel like that young people don't want to go work for enterprises anymore. And, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that we all kind of want to be in, you know, more and more in this kind of environment where we're being, you know, trusted to make our own decisions. And for engineers, I think uh, we are already um, almost answered my own question. And... Um, I feel like uh, it's a matter of, uh, you know, growing up. So uh, if you asked me five years ago, I was only interested in technology, more or less. Uh, you know, what we're doing, the more years that pass, the more I freelance, the more I work with, you know, different startups, agencies, the more I found that what it was really important to me was, uh, you know, to know what's the meaning behind the code that I write. What, what are the business? Uh, you know, what, 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 what kind of impact am I making? And how strong is the team that I'm in? You know, because if my team is strong, then I will be strong as well. Um, so I think this, this kind of mindset that, you know, it's a really beautiful environment to be in at the end of the day if you do it right. And it's hard to do it right, you know, really. And um, that's actually it. Um, thank you so much. You can find me on Twitter. And, uh, yeah, if anybody has any questions, I'd be more than happy to 
obliging. chain. I see there's an arm already there. Thank you, Yasha. <laughs> Questions? Yeah, I have a question, and thank you very much for spreading this message. I think this is an excellent message. Um, when things are going well, I think this works really well. But my question is mostly about when things are not going well. So let me ask you two questions um, about one financial and one about a team member. So let's assume that you get a team member who is really good, extremely good, technically uh, or whatever job they're doing, but they don't mesh with the team. How do you deal with that? Because the open society sort of dictates that there's a lot of issues and a lot of um, dissent that happen in that case. And the second question is, let's say that uh, you're either doing extremely well and making a lot of profit, which is now visible to employees, or you're not doing very well and people can see that you're running out of money. Either case, how do you manage expectations that people are not going to have huge bonuses that you need to reinvest into a business or that you're not going to close doors and you're going to get another investment or something like that? So those two questions are along the lines where things are not going well and you have an open door policy and an open society. Thanks. Um, yeah, okay, thanks. It's a really good question. And obviously, you know, when things are not going well, this is way harder to implement, uh, I would say. But in that, la I'd like to start with the second question. When you said, you know, when things are not going well, when we're not, you know, delivering on our business plans as we should, you know, what to do there? You know, if we're transparent, do we want to hide it? And I'd say no. Like, don't hide it. You know, people are not stupid. Like, you know that what we value is transparency. If you're not making it, if you're not there, like yet, we understand that. Right? We just want to be. You know, we just want you to be honest with us in some way, right? So if you're failing, tell us why we're failing, what we need to do to get there, and be really transparent with the numbers, right? We're failing by, I don't know, 5%, 10% because of this, or the summer was, uh, you know, was a little bit bad for us, or so on. So what do we need to do? Align people to, you know, have some sort of leadership. But if you don't have that leadership, if you just tell, oh, we're failing, sorry, and obviously, you know, you're, uh, nothing you can do. You can try to hide it, but, you know, people in this kind of environment, they're going to smell it instantly. So whatever you do, just be transparent. And if you have people like this, they're, gonna necessarily, they're gonna, probably going to respect you a lot because you gave them this, right? And they're going to help you to get to where you need to be as a leader. Right, so it all, all it takes, I, th I think, is transparency at some point. I think, I guess, again, it really depends on the size of the company. So, you know, if you're really huge, obviously, that you have a lot to lose. Um, I'm not saying that it's the, the bigger the company is, the bigger it is to integrate this. Like, I, I admit that, like, completely. But to answer your question, I would say it's all about transparency, so don't hide it. Um, is that okay for the second question? Thank you. Um, there was a, a, a first one also, right? So uh, can you repeat it uh, again? I think it was something about a, a about new, new hire coming in and what was the problem? Well, you have a new hire that um, fits in terms of the business requirements but doesn't fit in terms of the, um, I guess, um, team. Aha, uh -huh, doesn't fit in the team. So my question would be like, uh, why did you hire that person then? because they will get the business requirements done. Uh -huh. So they're probably a very good developer, but they're not gonna fit into the team very well. So maybe, huh, I see. Well, of course, like if he doesn't want to integrate or he or she doesn't want to integrate into the business in this kind of case, that's perfectly fine. At the end of the day, you have a goal to do, you know, so you can have your core kind of operating into, in this kind of environment, but you can still, if you, want, if you have to get stuff done, this is a part of this objective, so you know, we're not playing, we have to get stuff done. So if that means hiring somebody to do a job, let him come in and let him do a job. But the problem is that if he, you know, this is what Netflix refers to, I don't know if this is your case, but it, here it refers to kind of this concept of brilliant jerks, uh, you know, this kind of person can, at the beginning, feel like he's going to save your business. 
but what he's actually doing in the long run, he's actually taking your company culture way down because he's gonna be, you know, uh, spreading bad, uh, you know, bad, bad energy around the team, and you know, you're gonna have one person that's gonna, you know, kind of perform, but your whole team is gonna go down way if he's that kind of person. You know, if he just wants to do remote, if he just wants to, you know, do his job, and you know, he doesn't want to influence other people, that's perfectly fine. But the problem is when he starts spreading that kind of bad culture in your uh, team, and th this is, I think, where it's not worth it. So what Netflix says is, we hire no brilliant jerks. Even if you're the best, you know, machine learning expert, if you're a jerk, and if you're not going to be good for the team, sorry, we're going to tr try harder to find somebody else. You know, does that answer your question? It does. Thank you. Does it mean that, sorry, I have a question. <laughs> question sure. to a question. Does that mean that culture comes first? Company culture? Um, well, it depends. Like, if you're starting up, yeah, I think it's all about the leader, who, who is the first one. So the, how he behaves or he or she behaves, it usually will have a strong impact on how everybody else behaves. So if he, uh, you know, starts to create this kind of very functional, top-down approach uh, company, then obviously it's going to work that way. Uh, and if he's going to be successful or not, really depends on you know, how good they are. Um, but as I said, a lot of companies try to take that on later because now we actually found that engineers um, you know, prefer this kind of thing, I, at least in my experience. And a lot of companies have to adapt. And I think it's really clear to me by seeing a lot of advertisements here in HipCon, you know, everybody's talking about this. Everybody's talking how you're going to come in and you see advertisements with people playing hand foosball and billiards and you have a gym and, you know, it all looks like kind of really super USA culture. So I, I, I want to bet that these companies weren't that way from the beginning, but they saw that they have an engineering shortage and they're trying to adapt now. You know, so a lot of this marketing isn't, I mean, I wouldn't bet that this is actually the case. Like, you know, <laughs> it's not always perfect. You know, uh, there are times that you have to sit down, you have to do work. At the end of the day, you're there to do work. It's just like kind of kind of the approach that you have to dealing with people. And uh, yeah, I think that companies have changed. And a lot of these companies, I'm, I hope that they're not just, you know, it's not just marketing. I hope that these are actually their values. You know, I hope there's not this is not just a video on the screen at the end of the day. Um, so I think companies can change. So it can either be from the beginning or later on. You know, it depends on how it is. Right. Thank you. Any other questions for Yasha? Okay. Thank you, Yasha, once again. No problem. Great.